Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop, What is Your Personal Liability When Driving a Government-Owned Vehicle? My name is Devin Beckus, and I'm a Fleet Service Representative from the Harrisburg Fleet Management Center, New Cumberland Field Office. So uh, we've got a lot to go over, and we've got the question and answer box open. As we're going through and you have a question, type it in there. And if we don't get to it via um, <clears throat> typing an answer, we will answer every question that comes through either live or um, by typing an answer for you. Presentation will take oh, about 45 minutes to an hour. And then the best part of it, though, is the questions that come after. And if you have something very specific and unique, then I'll give you my email. and We can discuss it afterwards. So let's get going. So what happens if you cause a vehicle accident while driving a government-owned vehicle? Some questions that you might have to, to ask yourself are you have to pay money out of your pocket. Can you be sued? Are you covered by any type of insurance? Those are all good questions, all good questions. But the ultimate question of the session, are you personally liable if you're involved in a vehicle accident while driving a government vehicle and are at fault? Now, this includes all GOVs, all government-owned vehicles, whether they're GSA leased, agency-owned, tactical or non-tactical, and special purpose. And this year's special purpose vehicle, this is a, I believe, a TI-3000 from Nellis Air Force Base, courtesy of my, my good friend, John Thompson. This is a special purpose vehicle, and everything we talk about today applies to these types of vehicles as well. With any good class, there's always some type of disclaimer. The information provided in this presentation does not constitute legal advice, as any such advice needs to be based upon an analysis of law applied to specific facts by your agency. For specific guidance, you want to contact your agency fleet manager and or your agency's general counsel, the legal office. And because, well, the reason why is that each agency handles liability a little bit differently. And for those folks, if you happen to be searching this on YouTube on the recorded session, you'll want to look for the most recent posted presentation. It has the most current information. You know, the internet's forever, and there's old presentations out there that have older information. So make sure you're using the most current stuff. Why is this training important? Knowledge is power, folks. And the more you know and understand the topic of liability, you can better protect yourself and your agency, more so yourself, and always on offense. Remember, always on offense. When you're on offense, you're better prepared to meet the challenges of your everyday operations. You don't have to worry about being on defense. Yeah, it's kind of a, a sports related. We're going to give you some examples during this class of being always on offense, making sure that you're doing the right thing. So here's what we're going to talk about. Talk about your responsibilities when using a GOV. You'll talk about official use and misuse, permissible and impermissible use. The second part, we'll discuss your scope of employment, what it is. Liability assigned, we'll cover the Federal Tort Claims Act, and then we'll close it out with privately owned vehicles on government business and rental cars. We're going to cover liability and official business. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this is new information. It's about a year old. So this part is very important because the stuff that I taught last year has significantly changed. Here we go. What are your responsibilities when you use a government vehicle? Well, you've got to obey all motor vehicle traffic laws of the state and local jurisdiction, except where the duties of your position require otherwise. So if you're a fire, firefighter, a cop, an ambulance, you might be able to go a little bit faster than the posted speed limit. You might be able to go through one of the stop signs with the white border around it because, you know, those are optional in most places. Actually, all of them have the white border around it. But anyway, you still have to drive with due regard for safety. You still have to drive safe. If you're fined for an offense you commit while performing your official duties, but it wasn't part of your official duties, you got to pay that fine, that ticket on your own. If you receive a parking or moving violation or operating a government vehicle, you are responsible for paying the fine. You will not be reimbursed. You can't use appropriated funds to pay those fines. That agency driver is responsible. In my line of work being a fleet service rep, we occasionally get speeding tickets, <clears throat> uh, video speeding tickets, picture speeding tickets, toll violations months afterwards. So if you're the fleet manager and, and you, you loan vehicles out or you dispatch vehicles, have a good tracking document. Because when these things come months later, if you don't know who was driving that vehicle when, whenever the, the citation happened or the violation happened, someone's going to have to pay that. And you don't want it to be you. 
Some more of your responsibilities. You must pay parking fees and tolls while operating a motor vehicle owned or leased by the government. You can expect to be reimbursed for parking tolls and fees while performing official duties. The first legal term, you can expect. Hmm. What they're talking about is if you're driving a government-owned vehicle, you want to kind of you know, basically be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. If you have two parking lots, one is across the street, free to use, no worries, you can park there. We would expect that you park there because it doesn't cost money. And the other one is fenced in, and it costs you 50 bucks a day to park there. Which one would you use? For me, I'd rather park in the fenced-in area because you can justify not parking in an uns unsecured lot. But that's where that comes into play. And most of the time, I don't know if there's people that are out there doing your travel voucher saying, oh, hey, there was a, a, another lot there about 10 feet away. You should have used it. It was free. Keep an eye on what you're doing as far as uh, any parking goes. Most cases, it's not an issue. So what if you receive a toll violation notice? Just because we're in a government vehicle doesn't mean that we don't have to pay tolls. We have a requirement to pay tolls. If you get a toll violation notice, work with that respective state toll authority to pay the fee. And in most cases, you can use appropriated funds to pay those tolls. Now, I have a coworker to protect his identity. We'll, we'll call him, oh, let's go with that today. So that was on a temporary duty assignment. He was on travel and he was in a GOV. He had the transponder and he was going from Pennsylvania to New York, and he got on the New York Thruway, Interstate 90. It's a toll road. Everything's good. Got the easy pass, transponder, and everything's normal until four months later. We finally got the toll violation notice from a collection agency that, hey, you didn't pay the toll. Well, what really ended up happening because the, the, the vehicle was a GSA vehicle. The violation went to the correct address in the federal building, but it never got routed to the correct office. So what happened? We contacted the state toll authority, explained them what was going on, and the actual quote-unquote collection agency was part of the state. So there was no, no issue getting that thing taken care of. They took away the, the penalties. They took away any extra fees, and we just paid the regular toll with a, a GPC, government purchase card, and it was okay. <clears throat> All right. Let's switch a little bit to official use. What is official use? Official use is using a government motor vehicle to perform your agency's mission as authorized by your agency. Your agency lead makes that decision. I work for GSA Fleet, and it's not prudent for me to say what you can and cannot use your vehicle for. You might have a need to take it to a strip club. You might have a need to take it to, I don't know, marijuana dispensary or, say, a gym on a military installation. You might be allowed to do that. That's where the agency lead makes that decision. They also can dis they can also make the decision to allow incidental use. What is it? Incidental use is using that vehicle for other than official purposes. Well, how can you do that? It's not official. Let me give you an example. I work out of Harrisburg, PA in the general area, and I have to go to Scranton, PA, which is about a three-hour trip on Interstate 81 only because of traffic. When I go up there and... I have to do business, it's through my lunch. I'm allowed to take my GOV to a restaurant. That's incidental use. It's incidental to the mission. The other option that I have is take a brown bag lunch with me, you know, a sandwich. However, my agency lead has, has said, yes, I can take that vehicle to an establishment to get something to eat. Now, the thing you got to watch out for is that incidental use may be a taxable benefit. I've got the IRS publication. Take a look at page 36. And in most cases for us with, uh, with, with a government vehicle, if we use it for incidental use, it's not taxable because it's part of that official use. But take a look, especially for those folks who might have home to work. That agency lead, they're the approval authority to authorize non-federal individuals to accompany you in a GOV. Normally, unless there's authorization, you can't take your family members or candidates for the military or contractors. But it can be authorized if your agency allows it, that agency lead. That is when you can have other non-government people in those vehicles. Keep in mind, though, folks, 
What's okay for one agency may not be okay for another. So when you're out there looking and you see a, v, a GOV parked at a mar marijuana dispensary or a liquor store, it may or may not be okay. The marijuana industry is an all cash industry right now. Very few banks will do anything. Actually, I don't know of any banks that do anything with marijuana businesses. However, they still have to pay taxes. And there are federal, <clears throat> there are federal agents, IRS agents that have to go collect these federal income taxes. So a GOV is allowed at a marijuana dispensary. What about a liquor store? Hmm. How about alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, ATF? They might have an official reason to be there. Maybe, maybe not. And then also like a GOV parked at a military installation or gym, if you're on a temporary duty assignment, this is absolutely okay because you can go for you know, your physical training, whatever you need to do. And this last one I've actually personally participated in, GOV parked at the local grocery store or home improvement store. I'm a retired Air Force firefighter. And one thing that we would do routinely is go down to Home Depot and get a bunch of wood and we would make props, roofs. And we would go and we would train on cutting ventilation holes in these roofs. For me, it was okay to go down to Home Depot, the, the, the local home improvement store, and pick up these supplies that I needed to do my job. It was official. But other folks on base did not have that same leeway because they had no reason to go to some home improvement stores or a local grocery store to grab the stuff that they needed. Now, as far as a grocery store goes, that's like on temporary duty assignments. You, you definitely can go to a, a grocery store to pick up stuff. You may not use a GOV for transportation between your residence and place of employment unless it's approved in writing by your agency head. What we're talking about here is home to work. And the references are there. One thing to keep in mind that using agency is responsible to maintain documentation. Folks, this cannot be delegated, period, end of story. Cannot be delegated. Who is that agency head? It's the highest official of a federal agency. I work for GSA Fleet, Robin Carnahan. She is the agency head. She is the only one who can okay home to work. If you're in the Air Force, you're in the military, it's the service secretary, secretary of the Air Force, secretary of the Army. They're the ones who can sign for home to work, not the installation commander, not the garrison commander. They cannot do it. Home to work authorizations, those must be renewed. The renewal intervals vary, vary based on the type of home to work that's authorized. Usually it's two years for field work, which is what most folks do. And then 15 days for other circumstances like emergencies. And the reference 41 CFR 102-5.60, how long are initial determinations effective? But what if you have an emergency? When COVID happened, it was a very interesting time because all of a sudden there was some need for folks to take these vehicles home. Can they take them home? Only if the agency had is authorized at home to work transportation in an, in an emergency. It must be in writing. And this is where that emergency use comes from. Only 15 days. Folks, always on offense. Make sure you have that approval before you take that vehicle home. Before. You want to consult your agency's fleet manager for specific agency guidance. Each agency is a little bit different. Some folks out there, some agencies do not allow, do not allow home to work at all. The most recent change in the CFR for the home to work, it was rewritten to clarify employees using vehicles in conjunction with official travel from coverage by the regulation. It's not meant to give blanket authority to take a vehicle home prior to a TDY or travel. It just allows it to be done if your agency allows it and it's more advantageous to the government. How? Let me give you another example. I live in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and I have to travel about 40 miles to the east to my office. So if I'm going on travel and I end up having to go west, I could actually get it in my orders if my agency allowed us to do that to take the vehicle home the night before. I'm going to save about 80 minutes if I start my day out from home in my GOV and head west. Now, GSA does not do this. We do not do this just for, for full disclosure. But it can be done if your agency allows it. Follow your agency's guidance on official travel. Make sure you have written approval before you take that GOV home. Folks, always on offense. 
The approval should be on an official travel order, whether it's DTS, my travel coming in 2025 for the DOD, or Concur, E2, or whatever agency-specific system you use for TDY travel. Get it in there specifically. We'll take GSA lease vehicle. We'll take agency-owned vehicle with the license number home prior to going on this TDY. And William, you uh, will address your question here towards the end. Uh, we'll get into William. He threw a question there that we'll discuss later. Second change to the home to work, it was updated that employees use of vehicles between work and mass transit facilities is no longer covered by the home to work CFR. There's a new one. GOV use between work and mass transit facilities is now covered under 41 CFR 102-34-210. But here's the requirements. The head of the agency must make determination in writing and it's only valid for a year. There must be no safe and reliable commercial or duplicate of federal mass transportation services that serves the same route. And transportation is made available to other federal employees. And of course, you want to use AFVs to the maximum, maximum extent practicable. No safe and reliable commercial or duplicate of federal mass transportation services. Folks, the way this is written now, there's really no need for us to ever have to take a GOV to a mass transit facility. We've got Uber. We've got Lyft. We've got taxis. That's commercial transportation services. You could use those. But if that isn't available in your area or it's not convenient or not practical, then take that vehicle there. Now, the thing to keep in mind, though, is that if you take it to a, a airport or whatnot, you're still responsible if that vehicle gets damaged. If the vehicle gets damaged, you're, you're still responsible. All right. What can we do with that vehicle, with a government vehicle? We can make rounds of area work sites. We can attend official meetings, attend official training. You can go on official errands. You can also go from your TDY station to your hotel. Folks, the one word that rings true is official, official, official. It's official. Make sure, make sure that whatever you use in that vehicle is official use. Because when it's not, that's where things start to go south, and then you become part of the, this desktop workshop. Here's some things you can do with a GOV while you're on a temporary duty assignment. You can go to a drugstore, grocery store, a barbershop. You can attend worship services. You can eat at restaurants. You can visit a laundromat or a dry cleaner. And similar places necessary for the sustenance, comfort, or health of the employee. What does that mean? Something like that may be hard to define. Maybe a gym. That could be. Maybe going to a walking trail to go out on a, on, on a hike. Maybe, could be. What about extended temporary duty assignments? What about extended travel months on end? Things like that will be agency specific. Agency specific. You want to work with your agency fleet manager, work with your general counsel, even HR for questions like that. Here's some examples of impermissible use. Go and do a private social function, whether it's a birthday or a retirement party, a bar or a strip club, transporting people not authorized to be in the GOV. If you have a person that is in there, they may not be covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act. You don't want to do personal errands. Don't ever do personal errands in a GOV. And if you're in a leadership position, don't send your subordinates to do personal errands. We're going to discuss this here in a little bit. And the, the example that I have this year is absolutely disgusting. It, it, it I, it still irritates me, and you'll understand why. Some more things that you should not do, engage in entertainment activities while on a TDY, say the mall or a movie. Entertainment activities. Attend local sporting events and attractions. That all depends on your agency. And pick up hitchhikers. You don't want to pick up hitchhikers. But what if you're in a cold weather state? Do you have a legal requirement? Do you have a moral requirement? I used to live in Alaska. And for our folks that are in Alaska, if, if you happen to be in this class, Fairbanks, 50 below zero ambient temperatures. That's cold. If you've never been in cold like that, it's amazing. Take a cup of hot water, turns to cloud instantly. No water hits the ground. You may not have a legal responsibility to stop and help someone out on the side of the road, but boy, you sure have a moral responsibility. What do I recommend? Have a policy on how to address emergency situations. Have it in writing. For GSA, we have it in writing. I am okay. It says 
use of a government voter motor vehicle, I can render assistance in major disasters or emergency situations. For me, it's in writing. That's what I can do with my vehicle. So if there's an emergency alongside the road, flat tire, I consider that emergency. Cold weather, you know, X number of degrees out, that could be an emergency. We can help get that person to a place of safety. If you're the driver, find out if you have that. Find out if you have it in writing. Always on offense, folks. Ask the question before it happens. Some more examples of impermissible use of a GOV, carrying medicinal marijuana in a GOV for a patient. Currently, any use of marijuana is not legal under federal law. Even though legal in some states, it's still illegal according to the federal government. That might be changing. I can't say for sure. I'm trying to keep an eye out for it. But a lot of things, uh, they, they happen so fast and changes happen so subtly that usually I don't find out till afterwards. Some more examples of impermissible use, carrying a personally owned firearm in a GOV. Generally speaking, you cannot carry a privately owned firearm in a GOV unless you're performing a law enforcement mission. You want to consult your agency fleet manager or your general counsel for specific information and or authorization. I have absolutely no case law on a person carrying a privately owned firearm that's not a, a law enforcement official. So I've got nothing to give you as an example. Ask the question first, though. Make sure that you're allowed. Now, for those folks that say that they don't know, if you willfully use or authorize the use of a GOV for other than official purposes, the employee and or the supervisor is subject to suspension of at least one month or up to and including removal by the head of the agency. Folks, it's serious. You can get a free 30-day vacation for intentional misuse, willful. What if? This is one of my best slides. I like this one. My friend John DeWolf and I, we started this desktop workshop, the liability one, quite a few years ago. And we, we would get questions like this, folks. These are actual questions that we got from people that attended the desktop workshop. But Devin, you said you can't use your GOV to engage in entertainment activities well on TDY, say a mall or movie. Yes. Yes, I did say that. And you shouldn't do that. What if the restaurant's in the mall? Can I eat there, then go see a movie? No, you can eat there. Absolutely. But you should not go see a movie. This person was smart after we sent that reply. Well, what if I park on the other side of the street? Can I go to the mall or shop to shop or watch a movie? No, you can't make it fit your agenda. Folks, here's the scariest one. This is no joke. This was not uh, satire when this person sent us this email. What if I drink alcohol during dinner? Can I drive a GOV as long as my blood alcohol content is below the legal limit? Really? No, you should not. You should not. First and foremost, you, you, you don't want to, you know, it, you don't want to hurt anyone. But perception's reality. You're a target for scrutiny when driving a government-owned vehicle. People are looking for you to do something wrong. They're going to report you. Don't ever drink alcohol. Be prepared to justify your actions. Don't risk it. Folks, here's why. This incident was reported to How's My Driving at GSA.gov. To whom it may concern, on 22 October 2021 at 8.45 a.m., vehicle with GTAG number was seen at the Fine Wine and Good Spirit store. That is a Pennsylvania-based liquor store. The soldier got out of the vehicle, stood in line, purchased at least one bottle of a Midwinter Night's Dram Rye Whiskey. Apparently, this stuff is good stuff. Good enough to put your career on the line. Additionally, it appears a soldier was there with his supervisor. The supervisor was in civilian clothes, talking to another customer, saying something to the effect of, quote, sending him down to Kentucky when the PX gets a specific whiskey. This is absolutely disgusting. And if you think I'm kidding, there's the vehicle. Government tag and all. This is so wrong. Not because they're doing it. I mean, not only because they're doing it, but it is. Th there's a difference between ignorance and stupid. This, folks, this is stupid. Now, most of the time, nothing happens. But when they get into an accident and something happens, boy, is it going to get uncomfortable for a couple of people? Here's another one. Instant reported how's my driving at gsa.gov. I witnessed one of your soldiers speeding and driving while on the phone and failing to use a hands-free device. I am familiar with proper use of fleet vehicles as I used to drive and maintain them. 
date, 117, 2022 at 1403. Exact times. Good locations. They even got the tag number. They even got the tag number. <laughs> Guess what else they got? Oh, yeah. We got the picture. This is, I don't know, maybe he was watching YouTube. I, I couldn't tell you. Now, it does not look like he's moving because you don't see the shadow in the back, but I don't know how fast the camera was. It took the picture. I don't know if they were pacing or whatnot, but this person should not be driving like this. This is incredibly dangerous, incredibly dangerous. All right. I got one more picture for you. And, and I'm going to tell you that this picture was sent to me by someone very, very important. Her name is Erin and Erin works for GSA. And she, she actually, she told on herself, look at this. That's a GSA vehicle at a liquor store. Oh my gosh. Or so you would think. See folks, there are some not nice people out there. And some of these not nice people are going to take a picture to try and make you look bad. What you don't see in this picture is the restaurant that is right there in front of the, the, the GOV. This is somewhat of a loaded picture. Actually, there's somewhat. This is a loaded picture. Not everything may be what is in what you see. In this case, absolutely official use because there's a restaurant right there. This just happens to be one of those unique places where there just happens to be a liquor store attached to it in a little strip mall. If you're the fleet manager and you see something like this, take a look at what you're being shown because conveniently, this one doesn't have the restaurant attached to it. Look at some of this stuff with an open mind. Okay, so bad things happened. What happens after there's an accident? Well, an investigation has started. Here's the information that they're going to find out. Was a government employee negligent? Were they obeying laws? Were they speeding? Were they under the influence of drugs, alcohol, texting, talking on a cell phone? Were they within the scope of their employment? What does scope of employment mean? We'll get that in a second. Folks, this is incredibly uncomfortable from the standpoint of they are going to look at absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. But what is scope of employment? Well, it's a legal term. It's an activity authorized by a competent authority, whether it's a supervisor, standard operating procedures, policy orders, and they were serving at least in part a government purpose. It's determined by state law where that accident occurs. This is a critical component because some states are more friendly with official use than others. And under circumstances where the U.S., if a private person would be liable to the claimant under state law. Best way to explain this is think of a delivery driver in, say, like a AutoZone delivery vehicle or whatnot. Would that civilian be liable if they were driving in a similar circumstance? Some things that they're going to look at, the time, place, and occasion of the accident, was it during normal business hours? What's normal? If you're in the military, it's 24-7. That's normal. I work 6.30 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. That's my normal business day. If something happens outside of those hours, they're going to look close at it. Why were you in that vehicle after your normal hours? Well, you know, I got stuck on the road. I'm late because of bad traffic. That's okay. But it's going to be looked at. What was the act commonly done by such an employee? Do others in that office perform a similar function? And what was the extent of departure from normal methods of performance? Basically, how far to line did they go? And was it an act the employer reasonably could have anticipated? Sometimes these are quick. Sometimes they're not. I've talked to other folks who have attended this class, and this one young lady was at year four, four years, six depositions, and they still could not figure out if the driver was within the scope of their employment. Some more things they look at. Was the act motivated to serve the employer? Or was it personal? Let's go back to our guys buying whiskey. There's no way that that was allowed. It wasn't in the furtherance of the employer's business. And it wasn't for the accomplishment of the objective which employed. One thing to keep in mind, though, the Justice Department makes the final decision. It's a back and forth. And it's a quite exhaustive process. So when they get done with the answer, it's a good answer. <clears throat> Some out of scope of employment examples, commuting to and from work, depending on state laws. Intoxicated or willful negligence is generally not in scope. That should kind of scare you folks. 
underline generally in this one because I have case law where a person was drunk driving, hit a person, left the scene of the accident, and was found to be within the scope of his employment. Some more things they look at, out of scope, using a vehicle without permission, also known as stolen vehicle. Deviating from the route is generally not in scope. And the accident occurred when not doing something to promote the mission of the agency is generally not in scope. So let's talk about deviating from the route. If you're going from point A to point B and you get detoured to go around an accident, road close, construction, that is not deviating from your route. That is not what this is covering. Deviating from the route is as you're going from point A to point B and you decide to take a side trip 50, 60 miles out of your way to go see family, to go to a store. That is deviating from the route. That's what they're, discuss that's what they're talking about when they, when they discuss or talk about deviating from the route. Okay. Next one. I'm a firefighter in Carlisle, PA. This is actually an accident that we went on. Looks kind of bad. The person was injured. It was just the driver. This is how the vehicle ended up after it got hit. We did not have to do any extrication. Didn't have to use any tools. This speaks volumes about the safety and the engineering that goes into vehicles when there's an accident. This would have been a totally different story if there was a passenger there. There wasn't. Thank goodness. So we're talking about some case law. Bosco Lovi, the United States of America from March 2017. This is one of the most recent ones that I have. But here's a synopsis of the case. The marshal was provided a government vehicle for, for official use. He had home to work authorization. He was heading to work in the morning and he got a text message from his estranged wife saying that their son was ill and he needed to take care of him because the wife had to go to work. Marshall sent a message to his supervisor asking for leave and the supervisor approved it. What the marshal forgot to say is that he was in his GOV. So the supervisor approved the leave and he drove the GOV to his estranged wife's house to take care of his son. Now, on his home to work for form, he had his current address and he also had his wife's address. That was approved. At approximately 415, he left his ex-wife's house and got into an accident. The accident was so violent, it had actually rolled Mr. Boscolo's vehicle. What do you think? Don't need to put it in the chat. What do you think? Was this within the scope of employment or out of scope of employment? Well, the scope of employment had to be proven, and the burden was on the plaintiff, and they could not provide substantiative evidence the driver was within the scope of his employment. Ooh. The court found the U.S. Marshal was acting outside the scope of his employment, and they dismissed the claims against the defendant, United States of America, because the Marshal was not in his scope of employment, and that person is now liable for the accident and injury claims. But why? Remember how I told you this is an exhaustive investigation? Back and forth, back and forth, the United States Attorney. Uh, the, the, uh, I think plaintiff, yeah, plaintiff's attorney back and forth. The marshal had home to work privileges, but he was at his ex-wife's house. He didn't have home to home privileges. When he went from her house to his house, that's when he was not within the scope of his employment. Ideally, he should have went from his ex-wife's house, or soon to be ex-wife's house, to work and then back. He would have been okay, but he didn't do that. That's the issue. That's why he was not within the scope of his employment. Here's another one, Singleton versus Birchfield. This is from February 25th, 2005. And basically what this case shows is the impact a state ruling has on the entire situation. Here's basically the breakdown. An Air Force active duty airman, they were on a TDY temporary duty assignment to Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama, and they were there for six-week leadership school. This individual was, was issued a GOV at, to use at the TDY location. They were involved in an accident while en route to a study session at Tony Roma's. The individual was attempting to make a legal left-hand turn. The other driver tried to beat the light. So this individual pulls up to make a left-hand turn. And you know how we, they cannot go. So you edge out into the intersection when it clears and you can make your left turn. Well, the light starts to turn yellow. There's a car coming up, they stop, 
He starts to make his turn. There was another vehicle behind that car. They sped up, you know, red means stop, green means go, yellow means go faster. They went faster, come around that first vehicle and T-boned the GOV. Now, this individual was going to Tony Roma. See, they were going to a, uh, an off-base eating establishment. What do you think? Was this individual within the scope of his employment? According to AFI instruction, Air Force instruction, AFI 24-301, the motor vehicle should be operated as follows. Between places of business or lodging and eating establishments, drugstores, barbershops, and places of worship. But here's the neat thing. Under, under Alabama law, the mere use of a vehicle owned by an employer creates an administrative presumption that the employee was acting within the scope of his employment. Just the mere use. Now, for those folks that are in the military, especially in the Air Force, uh, Maxwell Air Force Base, meals were not available and directed, meaning they could not eat at the dining facilities on base. Everything that this individual did was correct. And he was within the scope of his employment. And then the other vehicle, actually, because the vehicle, they, they were responsible for everything because they did cause the accident. Talk a little bit about liability. What does it mean? Simply put, it means you're responsible. And how does it impact you if you're going to be found at fault? How? Well, you might have to pay money. Maybe. It all depends. Lots of investigations. Basically speaking, if you were driving a GOV and faulted for causing an accident, injury, and or damage, and you were acting in your scope of employment, you're covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act. You're covered. The federal government steps in as you. This applies to those third-party claims only, i.e. the other vehicle. If you were not acting in your scope of employment and you caused an accident, injury, or damage while using a GOV, you're personally liable. This could get expensive. What the Federal Tort Claims Act does is allow individuals to recover against the federal government for personal injury, wrongful death, and property damage caused by negligence of a federal employee acting within their scope. And the only type of relief allowed under the FTCA is money damages. Unfortunately, it's about the money, you know, and, and I say that it's just a way to compensate the person who was wronged. You know, if, if there's a fatality, I'm sure that that person who lost a loved one didn't care about the money, bring their loved one back. But this is the way that Federal Tort Claims Act claims are satisfied. The Federal Employees Liability Reform and Tort Compensation Act of 1988, it amended the Federal Tort Claims Act. Now it's the exclusive remedy for torts or lawsuits committed by federal employees within the scope of their employment. Generally speaking, you're protected from being personally sued by a third party as long as you're acting within the scope of your employment. And once again, with every good rule, there's an exception. Basically, it provides that the Federal Tort Claims Act does not apply to claims arising out of a litany of things, except if you're a police officer. Federal Tort Claims Act will cover you for assault, battery, false imprisonment, false arrest, malicious prosecution, if you happen to be within your scope of employment. Now, that one, I don't have any case law to give you an example, but it's in there. So there is probably some case law out there somewhere. I just don't have access. Basically speaking, the Federal Tort Claims Act is a federal government's insurance policy. Essentially, it substitutes federal government for the individual as a defendant. And the using and owning agency pays the third-party claim if their driver is at fault and working within the scope of employment. So you have to work with your agency legal counsel. Because if you're involved in a vehicle accident or at fault within your scope of employment, work with the agency's legal office because they're the POC agency for legal claims against the government, i.e. if it's the Air Force, Army, Marine Corps, any branch of the military, it's their JAG, Judge Advocate General. It's your agency's general counsel. And for those folks who have contractors, how are they covered while driving a GSA GOV? Well, this all depends on how that contract is written. If it's cost reimbursable, meaning leased directly from GSA, they must abide by FAR 51-2. Sole responsibility of that contracting officer to ensure the requirements are met. If you have contractors, you make sure or should make sure that that contracting officer has made sure that the requirements are met. FAR 51-202 requires contractors leasing directly from GSA to provide proof of vehicle liability insurance. And my good friend, Stacy. She gave me this reference, FAR 28-.307-2, for liability insurance requirements. It lays it out what they're supposed to have. It's a very good, very good reference document.
take a look at it. Now, if it's the federal agency providing leased or owned vehicles to a contractor in performance of a contract, that federal agency is responsible to ensure the contract clauses are in place to protect the government's interests. Once again, if you are in this position, reference the FAR and make sure that those folks can prove to you that they have the required liability insurance requirements. Because if not, and you're providing these vehicles to this contractor, and they don't have the insurance, say it's a GSA vehicle, we're going to bill you. Because that's just how we do. We don't bill a contractor. We bill that, that BOAC, that customer number for the uh, accident. What about government contractors? Are they allowed to ride in a GOV? Folks, reference slide 11. Yes, they can, providing that your agency allows it. They can. Anyone out there driving Canada or Mexico? This one's a good one. Many foreign countries do not recognize U.S. government self-insurance. If your agency is not covered under a SOFA, a status of forces agreement, or other dip diplomatic tre treaty, which specifically addresses liability issues, GSA's general counsel office determined that an agency must, folks, must purchase additional liability insurance to operate vehicles in foreign countries. The Federal Tort Claims Act does not protect federal employees outside the United States. Canada doesn't recognize the United States self-insurance. You want to contact your agency's general counsel office for assistance. If you have a short duration trip, consider a commercial rental that are inclusive of insurance in foreign countries. If you have a bunch of agency-owned or GSA vehicles that you need to get insurance for, send me an email. Other folks who were in this class gave me some really good information that I will pass on to anyone if you need it. I don't want anyone to get themselves in trouble. What about damages to government vehicle? You're the driver, you're a government employee, you're at fault. There's damage to the government-owned vehicle. We know that the Federal Tort Claims Act protects them from the third-party liability. Can you, the driver, be held liable for damages to the government-owned vehicle? Can you? Yes. You can be held liable for the damage to the GOV. The Federal Tort Claims Act covers those third-party claims. It does not cover the damage to the agency-owned or leased vehicles. And this guidance is based on a Department of Justice ruling for the EPA, Memorandum of Opinion for the Acting General Counsel, EPA. How do you protect yourself in this case? Will your Personal insurance, take care of it. Depends on your insurance agency. I have State Farm, and I called my insurance agent, presented them this, this same scenario, and I could get a rider that says, I, I'm covered when driving other agency vehicles. Other, I'm sorry, other owned vehicles, they called it. Other owned vehicles. So I could do that but I'm not real worried about it. I did not get that coverage. But what happens? Well, the policy is going to vary by each agency, but typically a board of surveys convened to review the case. It's an official investigative and vetting process. They will have to prove some type of negligence. And the investigation will decide if the at-fault driver has to pay for damages to the GOB. And a couple of examples are the Army Flipple or an Air Force report of survey. In the past, I had an agency who said that their commander was just going to charge a blanket deductible fee if there was an accident. That's not allowed, folks. There's got to be an investigation. You can't just blindly bill someone because there was an accident. That's not the way this works. It's laid out of what needs to be done, and most federal agencies handle this very, very well because it does happen quite a bit. All right, so someone had asked about POV use on government business. This is important, folks. It's important because this is definitely one where you got to protect your six, watch your back. In most cases, use of personally, personal vehicles for the benefit of the government is prohibited unless officially authorized. And when it's authorized, the employee is reimbursed on a mileage base, basis. The cost of collision liability insurance is a component of that mileage reimbursement. If you're involved in an accident in your POV, you were at fault and had proper authorization to use your POV for government business. You cannot be held liable for damage or injury to third parties if acting within your scope of employment. You're covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act. This doesn't indemnify you from discipline or adverse actions for negligence. I'll give you an example when I talked about it before, that individual who was driving drunk and hit a person, there could have been other discipline or adverse uh, actions for that individual. But how do you protect yourself? Someone tells you that you can use your, your 
POV for government use. And you're like, okay, good. Get it in writing. Get it in writing. Social Security has their own uh, fleet um, policy where their vehicles, it's in there in their document that they're covered using their POV. It's in writing. There you go. If you don't have that, get it in email. Get it a, a, on a document. You don't want your supervisor or someone having you know, selective amnesia. Oh, I never said that. Don't rely on the verbal okay. Make sure that you get it in writing to protect yourself. You, the employee must seek reimbursement from their private insurance carrier for loss or damage to their vehicle while under POV travel authorization. Folks, before you use your POV for work-related travel, contact your insurance carrier to see if and how you're covered. Research what type of coverage you may need, whether it's an umbrella policy, whether it's a rider for using your vehicle for government business, or that other owned vehicle rider. Ensure you have the proper coverage to protect your vehicle. Here's what happened to me. I, thank goodness, did not have an accident, so nothing like that happened. Based on this information, I contacted my, my insurance company, State Farm again, and I said, am I covered? They said, no. Not only, if you got into an accident, not only would we not cover it, we'd probably drop you. You can get a rider for it. And the rider was just incredibly inexpensive. It was like $26 for six months. They really didn't care about the vehicle part. The question that I got is how many people are you going to be driving? It was more about the personal injury that they were concerned of. Don't assume that you're covered by your insurance company if you use your vehicle for government business. Because you might be surprised. I did find out during my research that the Amica Insurance Company does not cover you for government use or if you use your private vehicle for government use. Now, one of the good things is that the employee may file a claim under the Military Personnel and Civilian Employees Claims Act for the deductible amount of the employee's personal insurance policy. You want to work with your agency's general counsel to submit and process the claim. Now, you can Submit the claim doesn't mean it's going to be approved, but there is an avenue out there for you to get some of your money back so you're not just stuck holding the bag. The most important thing about POV use is authorized. Make sure it's authorized because an employee cannot arbitrarily use their vehicle without proper authorization to perform government business and expect to be covered. And a lot of people out there just expect that they're going to be covered because, oh, well, I'm doing government business, and that's not the case. Protect yourself. Research it. Make sure, make sure that you have in writing that you're covered. All right, folks, here's the new stuff. Rental cars. This is updated information. This is the new stuff. This is the change. Generally, drivers are covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act. The scope of employment, official use rules apply. If you happen to get a rental car, use the government rate because it provides a myriad of protections to the drivers. Take a look at rental agreement number four. Here's why this is important. I've rented vehicles and I've always got the supplemental insurance because they sold. It's great. It's great. But if you rent under rental agreement number four, here's what rental agreement number four says, quote, the company and not the renter or the U.S. government hereby assumes and shall bear the entire risk of loss of damage to the rental vehicle, including costs of towing, administrative costs, loss of use, and replacements from any and every cause whatsoever, included but not limited to casualty, collision, fire, flood, upset, malicious mischief, vandalism, tire damage, falling objects, overhead damage, glass breakage, strike, civil commotion, theft, and mysterious disappearance, except where the loss or damage is caused by one or more of the following. So that list is there is not all inclusive, but this is out of rental agreement number four. And if a rental company is renting to you, uh, say uh, you use your, one of your, your travel sites and you're paying a GARS fee, they have rented to you under rental agreement number four. There's no need to get that additional insurance because they have already agreed that they're going to cover all of that unless there's abuse, and it's in rental agreement for what they won't cover for. We encourage you to use those companies that offer that government rate because of those protections that they give you, that they provide for renting under rental agreement number four. What about after hours of extended TDYs? Can I use a rental car for personal use? Folks, in classes past, this no longer applies. 
you could use your rental vehicle for personal use. The biggest issue is how do you reimburse the government for it? That has changed. 41 CFR 301-10.450 was updated April 22nd of last year, and it added paragraph F. And paragraph F clarifies how the government rental vehicle must be used. And it's, quote, for official purposes. There is no longer any mention of personal use. It was amended to read a rental car is to be used only for official purposes, which includes transportation between places of official business, between such places of temporary lodging when public transportation is unavailable or its use is impractical, or between either subcarrier of one or two, and so on. Folks, there's no more personal use with the rental vehicle. But Devin, I'm, I'm TDY. I got I to gotta be able to go to some you know, other places, personal use. I want to go to a restaurant. No, that's not personal use. That's official. Personal use is, say, taking that rental vehicle on a weekend and you drive a couple hundred miles to go visit a family member. That's personal use. That's what they're referring to under personal use. If you have questions on what personal use might be, contact your agency fleet manager, contact your agency general counsel. Make sure you know what is considered personal use before you use it. Folks, we're at the end. My gosh, I can talk a lot. I'm sorry if I bored you. I didn't want to make it death by PowerPoint, only just sheer torture. But here's the ultimate question of the session. Are you personally liable if you're involved in a vehicle accident while driving a government vehicle and you're at fault? And folks, drum roll, that answer is most definitely maybe. It depends on the mitigating circumstances included, but not limited to official use, scope of employment, the state the accident was in, and fault. You want to contact your agency's fleet manager or general counsel for more information. Folks, here's what we got. Here's what we went over. We talked about your responsibilities when using a GOV. We talked about official use and misuse, permissible and impermissible use, scope of employment, liability assigned, the Federal Tort Claims Act, privately owned vehicles and government business, and we discussed rental cars. And we finally answered that liability question. The next couple of slides are just references that we used, and I'm going to go through them just to get to this last part, if you have a question that is detailed, that is specific to you, give me an email uh, or send me an email. Give me a call. Email is going to be better because I get pretty busy after these, and I'll get you pointed in the right direction. I'm not qualified to give you legal advice. Your agency's general counsel can do that, but shoot me an email. I'll get you pointed in the right direction. Okay, so here we go. Now, everything is muted, and what I'm going to do is start going through these questions as we have in our, our question and answer as they came in. And the first one is from Victoria. If a GOV is driven home and back with official authorization and emergency, like an emergency uh, situation, say routing, are those trips taxable as commutes per the IRS regs? Uh, Victoria, I'll tell you what, I would reference the IRS um, link that I sent there. I do not know. I know that there's uh, some unique stuff about home to work, but I don't know if it's broken down by, say, like official travel. Um, I can't even hesitate to guess. So I would say reference that document and, and then talk with your agency fleet manager or even HR. HR is another good one that, that, that would help you out there. Tamara says, would mass transit facility also include airport parking lots? Yes, it would. Because ideally you go to that airport mass transit facility and then you park in the lot. Michael says, if you're in an emergency, written authorization from whom? Manager or agency director? Michael, from your agency. So like for GSA, it's in our policy doc already, so it's authorized. Whatever agency you work for, ask the, ask the agency fleet manager, hey, if we have an emergency, are we allowed to intervene? If you're in Alaska, do we have to stop? You know, like I said, there's that legal and moral dilemma. Because, you know, if you don't stop in a place like that where it's 50 below, there's a good chance those people are going to die. People can't survive very long out in the cold. Talk with your agency, find out where the written authorization is, and, you know, ask the manager, ask the agency director, ask someone there and just say, hey, do we have it? If not, can we get it? All right. Seasonal employees going from the office to the barracks where they're staying, they're not on TDY orders, but they're not local and don't have personal vehicles and are residing about three miles away. Not always safe to ride bikes. Are they allowed to take a GOV to the barracks, their home at the end of the day? Great question for your agency. Sounds like to me that it would be okay because it's their, you know, their, their uh, 
a seasonal employee, it sounds like you might be in Alaska or something like that, work for National Park Service. Um, National Park Service has stuff written out already about what they can do with vehicles. And it's very a very good document where all of that stuff is there. So um, reference that. But based on what you're telling me, it does not sound like it would be a problem. However, you know, trust but verify. Get it in writing. Make sure you've got it before that happens. James says, I know there are laws to prevent carrying a firearm inside federal and or other public buildings. But what recruits carry a firearm in a GOV? Wouldn't a Second Amendment cover that? Um, well, Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. However, there's rules with uh, weapons in, in a federal vehicle. And it could be the same that are you know in a federal building. That's why I say contact your agency because I don't have anything on that. Um, and if you're law enforcement, I mean, a lot, a lot of law enforcement officers, have, they buy their own vehicles. It's privately owned, and that's their duty weapon. So they would be allowed to do that. But as far as a person who's not law enforcement can't say how they would be able to carry in there, but that would be up to each agency. Andrew says, what if a tribal customer is non What if it's a tribal customer, not federal? Do they fall under the scope of employment rules? Yes, they do. Scope of employment is scope of employment. And if it's a tribal customer, their scope of employment rules are a little different. You know, it, it de depends on the tribe. It depends on, on that stuff, but they're still the official uh, scope of employment rules. Sean says, what if we are given an hour and a half to get from point A to point B because roadmap gives that time and distance? Said person doesn't consider traffic or people who drive 10 miles an hour under the limit and you can't get around them safely. Does this consider the safety aspect um, Sean, if you have people that are that anal and are not really worried about the safety thing, then they've got a huge problem. And if they think that I'm going to be, oh, this is me. If they're going to try and tie me down to a time, no. I would say do what is safe. Remember I talked about driving with due regard for safety? That's where that would cover. And if this person is that bad, where they're going to say, well, Google says it's going to take an hour and a half and you take two and a half hours because of traffic and or accident or whatnot, then it's time to get, you know, HR involved and say, hey, this is going on. We're being, you know, harassed because of this. But just like I said, drive with due regard for safety. Rex says, can you briefly address personal liability for LEOs if involved in an accident while transporting an arrestee? Um, already covered it, Rex. All right. If you get into an accident, you're within the scope of your employment, you're covered under third party claims. Doesn't matter who's in there. Your mission is to transport that person who is being arrested. So you know they're covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act per se because if they file a claim, they got hurt, then Federal Tort Claims Act will step in as a defendant. Joe says, uh, says, is there an official limitation on maximum hours of driving in a 24-hour period when using a GOV? Joe, that depends on your agency. Your agency may do that. So when I was in the military and I, I left uh, for Alaska, I had travel days and travel days were based on 55 miles an hour, <clears throat> eight hours a day. So that's kind of your max as far as that goes. Um, talk with your agency and find out. There's DOT rules out there, a number of hours that you can drive. And I would think that those all apply because you still have to do the books and whatnot. Um, but specific for your agency, twofold. Agency fleet manager and human resource in this case would be another good one. Good question. James says, flipple or reporter survey is necessary if there is damage to a GOV. I don't know if you're asking or whatnot. I've had folks, um, uh, my experience when I was a vehicle control officer for the Air Force, uh, we didn't do a report a survey, but there was an investigation and it wasn't, uh, it, it was the civil engineer folks, the finance folks who, uh, they just needed the paperwork and whatnot. If there was negligence, then a report or survey was done. Uh, I do know Army is a, a little bit more unique to where they they do a flip on every single accident. So Andrew says, can you please explain what the GOV being self-insured means? Basically, what a self-insurance means is that there is no policy that you pay. There's no policy that you pay into. Your agency will pay that claim. So if you get into an accident, you're at fault, Andrew, and you've damaged another vehicle, and it's just damage, 
they'll go through the process of filing a claim against the government. That's where the, the legal team comes in. And say the, the, the cost to repair everything, you know, medical bills and all that is $10,000. $10,000 is going to come out of the coffers of your agency to pay that claim to the other individual. And all that is done through your legal, legal team. Daniel says, is the immediate supervisor who officially authorizes POV use? Daniel, it could be the immediate supervisor. It could be, say, like a, a uh, office supervisor. It could be the agency. It's not as stringent as home to work. And if it is that office or immediate supervisor, if they're authorizing POV use, what is the document that says they can? There's got to be a reference there somewhere that they can use their, their POV. And if that person is using their POV, it might be good just to remind them, hey, make sure you got the proper coverage if you're using your, your POV for government business. Matt says, would the POV discussion cover if you're driving to the airport for TDY? No, POV use doesn't cover under that. That would be covered under your own insurance from this standpoint because you're going to basically to work. No difference than when you leave your house and you're going to your office. That's, it would be covered under your regular insurance. Where, where the POV discussion comes in is when you go to work, you're at work, and now you got to take your, your POV to you know, such and such place for a meeting because there's no government vehicles available. Or you have to go and deliver something in your POV because there's no other way to do it. That's where the POV use comes in. What if your POV is broken into and or damaged while at the hotel or TD on TDY? Um, Sean, in this case, I'm willing to bet that that's going to be your POV insurance because you're paid for the uh, – you're paid mileage, and that covers that. That covers that insurance. And if it's broken into or damaged – uh, the Federal Tort Claims Act protects you from third party where you hit someone. If someone else hits you or some, something breaks or someone breaks into your vehicle, it's covered under a different part of insurance. If you get hit and they have insurance, their insurance pays for it. If your vehicle is broken into, it's your own insurance that would end up paying for that. I believe that's comprehensive. Uh, Rex says, for using POV and work-related travel, does an approved travel authorization concur saying that you can use POV account as approval in writing? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Anthony says, who is the approving authority for use of POV for government business? Um, could be on a travel document. Anthony could be the other folks that we were talking about. You know, a, a could be the immediate supervisor. It could be, you know, someone in, in that chain of command that will be uh, dependent on your agency. Now, the other part too about this, folks, um, you can't direct me to use my POV. If you're my supervisor, you can't say you have to use your POV. No, no, I don't. I don't. Because that's not how it works. There's other avenues. There's GSA short-term rental. You can rent a vehicle to use if you have if you have trips to do. You can't force your an employee to use their POV because your know, perfect example. If they have Amica insurance, Amica is not going to cover them. Good question, Anthony. I like it. Appreciate it. Alex says, I joined this call late, so I apologize. This was already covered. Our duty station is in a rural area, and we often need to drive to town about 50 minutes away to conduct official government business. Sometimes it's just to complete a simple five-minute tax, such as picking up a print job from FedEx. Several employees live in town. On their drive home from work, there are they allowed to use their POV to conduct tasks like these? They could. They sure could, Alex, but I would get it in writing before they do and also make sure that they, those, those employees realize that they should check to make sure that they're covered if something happens. Most of the time, 99.999% of the time, nothing happens and it's business as usual. But that one time when something happens and they do the investigation and things start getting a little squirrely, be a good idea to make sure that they're covered. Brooke says, can a manager grant authorization to use a POV for government business as a blanket office policy? Um, sure. Depend on that agency. Keep in mind, Brooke, though, too, is that you can have a policy for POV use, but your folks that are in that office don't have to use their POVs for government business. You can't force them. Matt says, is there guidance on what considers a reasonable distance for restaurants, et cetera, while on TDY? Um, I'm sure there is, Matt, but I, I really wouldn't be able to tell you where to go. I have not seen anything yet. Um, 
you know, as far as restaurants go, let's uh, let's break this down a bit. Most places you go to have all kinds of different restaurants, McDonald's, uh, you know, even you know, uh, mom and pop restaurants, burger joints, things like that. But what if you have a unique, say you have celiac disease and you've got to go totally gluten-free. There's gluten-free specialty places out there. Uh, or you have a, a uh, you're allergic to, say, peanuts. And they make a lot of stuff in peanut oil. And you're so sensitive that it would you know, cause an issue. You might have to go to a specialty place. That would be up to your agency, but it's a good question to ask. Um, I, I have not, I don't have any case law to say, hey, you know, they went this many miles and it wasn't covered. Um, work with your agency. Good question to ask them. Tricia says, what about if you're traveling TDY for official business and take leave in conjunction? Can you take your POV? Trisha, yeah, if it's on your orders, sure. If you go TDY and you have it on your orders that you can take your POV, sure, there you go. You can. Make sure it's in writing. Cover yourself. Sean says, what about movies in a rental on TDY? I think we answered that one. No. No personal use. No personal use for those vehicles. The other options, Uber, Lyft, taxi, cab. It's not that they don't want you to you know, go out and enjoy yourself. But if you do and you get into an accident in a, in a rental and they discover that it's personal use, you're going to be uh, – you could be in some pretty serious trouble. Dan says, is the immediate supervisor the one who officially authorizes POV use? Yeah, Dan, it can be. Depends on the agency. Can be. Sharon says, POV for official business. What agency has a form that can be used to document the approval of POV for official business? POV not available. Um, I don't have one, Sharon. Uh, the one thing I can say is travel orders. Uh, there might be a local one for your agency, but I don't have like a, a, a library of forms for other agencies out there. So, you know, ask the question and see if someone doesn't have one. And if anyone out there listening has one, shoot it to me via email and I can, I can share that with people. Loretta says, what if GSA used from work to home just to put mileage on with no prior authorization? Loretta, if that's the case and you use a GOV from home to work just to put miles on, I hope you don't get into an accident. It's not authorized. Home to work has to be authorized by the highest official of your agency. Um, and the excuse to put miles on is not a good enough excuse because what ends up happening is in the investigation, why did you have this vehicle on? Well, I was putting miles on it. My boss told me to. Or I was just putting miles on it because I didn't want it, you know, to to just idle and and sitting unused. Protect yourself. If you're going to take it home, make sure that you have the proper authorization. Brian says, "Can you talk more about how the flippable process works?" Uh, Brian, I cannot because I'm not an army. I, I don't work for the army, and that's army unique, and uh, it's it's their own process for investigating accidents. Um, I would say talk to agency fleet manager and or general counsel, they would be able to explain that a whole lot better than I could. Sharon says, you went too fast on who to talk to when on TDY with a rental vehicle and what is or isn't considered personal use. Um, so personal use with a rental vehicle when you're on a TDY is not going to the store for groceries, is not going to rent, uh, going to a restaurant to eat. That is allowed with a rental vehicle. Personal use is when you take that vehicle for something personal, going to see a family member X number of miles away, uh, going to a, you know, say you're in, in Minnesota and you want to go to Mall of America. That's personal use. Does that help, Sharon? If you need more, my email's there. Just go ahead and shoot me an email. Kevin says, can you revisit the airport? If leaving office and going to airport on official travel, you are saying you cannot use a GOV? No, I'm not saying that you can't use a GOV. I'm saying that you have options. Commercial travel, Luber, Lyft, um, taxi. But in some cases where that isn't viable or there's a reason why it won't work, say after hours trip coming back or whatever it may be, you can use that GOV. It's covered under a different CFR that's in the presentation. And you know, follow that. Make sure that it's in writing by your agency lead. Make sure that it's there. All the stuff is covered as far as what is supposed to be there. Jacqueline says, when picking up vehicles from the rental agency under GSA short-term rental, does it matter who signs for the vehicle as the driver? Um, 
Jacqueline, I'm not sure. I've never had to do short-term rental. I would say no, but there's a help desk number for short-term rental. Call and ask them. I don't think so because it's pretty much no different than, you know, when you have a GSA vehicle, we, we don't require driver's license or anything like that. That's up to the agency to manage, but ask the short-term rental help desk folks. Alexander says, if a family emergency arises, can we transport our child or our spouse to the hospital with a GSA vehicle? Um, hmm. Break it down. Why would your family be with you if you're in a GSA vehicle? Do they have authorization? If you have home to work with a GSA vehicle, ideally, you'd probably want to take your POV first. If it's that serious, call an ambulance because they can start doing uh, medical interventions faster than you can get them to the emergency room. And then additionally, if, you're, if your family's authorized and all that, uh, and, and check to see what your agency says about emergencies. For me, I could, but the hiccup is why would my family be with me? Um, I, I, where I go, my family doesn't go with me as far as TDYs and whatnot. And I know there's people that do, there's agencies that allow it. Um, but I'm just saying for me, GSA, I don't do that. Karen says, if I'm TDY and driving a GOV, can I go to a grocery store to buy a bottle of wine with my other items and transport it back to the place of lodging? Um, you can go to grocery stores to get stuff. I can't say, Karen, whether you can get a glass or a bottle or a case of you know, wine, whatever it may be. Um, Have I seen it happen? Yes. Um, you know, is it questionable? Yeah, it could be. Why are you taking that government vehicle to get beer or wine or booze, um, even if it isn't in, in a store? Uh, Alaska, great example. All, they have wine, beer, and liquor in Walmarts in Alaska. Might not look the greatest, but ask your agency. Can I do that? Get permission first. Make sure you're covered. Cindy says, is a military assignment while working for FWS considered official duty, and can they take a GOV to the airport to get to the military assignment and or detail? Cindy, great question for your agency. Great question for Fish and Wildlife Service. Great question for the fleet manager and or general counsel. Peter says, the form they have us fill out is DL Form 1-177EV to take the GOV home. Um, okay. I'm wondering if that isn't the home to work form. I can't say for sure. Cause I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know. So that if that sounds right, go with that. Okay. Ulysses says, if you have a, dis uh, a, a blue tag, basically a disability, can a GV park in a handicapped parking spot? Um, I don't see why not Ulysses. If you have that handicapped placard, that, that tag, I believe that is assigned to you and not the vehicle. So if you have a disability and you've got that tag, great, use it how it's supposed to be used. And just because you know, you're in a GOV doesn't take your disability away. Use it. And I see no issue with it. Um, yeah, it, no issue with it. Daniel says, is the immediate supervisor when who officially authorizes POV use? Daniel, it depends on the agency. I would ask that question. It could be the supervisor. It could be the supervisor, supervisor. It could be a blanket document already for the agency, depending on who you, who you talk to. Andrew says, does a permit telework person need home to work authorization if there is, is a, if their home is their duty station? Great question, Andrew. This is one that we've got recently since COVID, and I don't have an, I don't have an answer yet. Um, I would say, Get the okay to make sure that you're covered and ask that question to your agency. Make sure this, – this is a good one, and if you don't mind, my email is up there. Uh, keep, me, keep me posted on what they say because I don't have an answer on that yet. We have a lot of people post-COVID who are now working from home full-time. And if you have a GOV, well, I mean, it, it might be home to work, but the vehicle's still at your house. 
Good question. Please keep me updated on that one. Chris says, what requirements does the federal government have to train employees to be ready for driving in inclement weather? Is online training good enough or is behind the wheel driver's training offered and or required? If required, is your federal class or local public safety EVOC satisfactory? Chris, great question for your agency. Um, like I said, I was in Alaska, did a lot of driving up there in the snow. And yeah, it, it, online training does not do justice for actually behind the wheel driving because, you know, Front wheel drive is different than rear wheel drive. Four wheel drive is not the end all safety thing for driving in the snow. Um, four wheel drive gets you going. It doesn't too much doesn't do too much good for the stop if you're going too fast. So a lot of things to consider. And I would ask your agency. Uh, a retired Air Force firefighter, and we had EVOC training. And being in Alaska, it was great because we had EVOC training on slick roads. Uh, we do it out on the flight line, and it was really good training to be able to spin a vehicle and nothing is around. And all of a sudden, for those folks who know what a P-19 is, when you're doing 360 after 360 and you're not slowing down, it's intimidating. It's hands-on training by far is the best. Good question. I like that one. All right. Cindy says, can I drive a GOV from the office, my official TDY start point, pick up an employee at their house? where their TDY starts and drive to our meeting destination. Um, Cindy, I would, I, would, I would ask that question. And if you're gonna do that, get it on your, on your orders. Get it on your TDY orders. We'll pick up this person there. Um, in that case, it is a, it sounds like it'd be you know, beneficial to the government because it would save mileage rates for that person. Can it be done? Sure, just gotta be approved. Make sure it's approved. If pulled over for a traffic stop, what do we submit as proof of insurance or is it assumed that it's a GOV and insured? Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to shock you. There are some ignorant police officers out there. I know, shocking, shocking. Now, is ignorance bad? No, I'm ignorant on several things. Ignorance means you just don't know. A lot of folks do not know how insurance, quote unquote insurance, applies to federal vehicles. If you have a GSA vehicle, you have an accident kit, and on the back of that accident kit shows proof of insurance. And if you have an agency-owned vehicle, you should have the same thing. Basically, it cites the Federal Tort Claims Act as proof of insurance, and the agency is self-insured. Now, I have been involved in where a police officer pulled a vehicle over and did not understand the self-insurance. The person got a ticket, and you know it, it happens. You're not going to stop that. That's the ignorance part. And when it came time for the quote unquote trial, the judge was very cool and explained to the officer, this is how it works. The officer was no longer ignorant. They were, they were, you know, educated. They were trained on it. They know now. If you don't have it in your vehicle, that's a problem. You should have a copy of that in your vehicle showing that it's a U.S. government vehicle and self-insured. Doug says, along with the Canada and Mexico not recognized U.S. government insurance, do you know about uh, American Samoa and Puerto Rico, do they recognize it? Puerto Rico, yes. American Samoa, I cannot say for sure. I do not know for sure for American Samoa. For those folks out in Zone 4, Jason Portillo's folks, if you guys can find out and shoot me a quick uh, email, uh, I would appreciate it. That way I can add that. Thanks, Douglas. Good question. Gene says, so to be clear, if driving a POV, you must check your insurance to see if it's covered under the umbrella policy. If not, you must get a policy that covers it. Gene, if you use your POV for government use, for government business, contact your insurance company to see if you're covered. Because they can say, no, we're not going to cover you for federal government work because you're covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act. That's true for third party, but that doesn't hold true for your POV as far as if you get damaged, if it gets damaged, it's, it's on you. And if the insurance company saying they're not going to cover you because you're using it for government use and we didn't know it, that'd be good to know beforehand, before something happens. Glenn says, we can't use POV to pick up government mail, correct? Well, Glenn, you could. You could do that if your agency allows it. And folks, for all of you, if, if you're using your POV for government use, Submit your travel voucher. Submit and get the mileage. All right. Let's move on. Keep going. Sarah says, so what if I says, what if you are using your POV for official business and someone damages your vehicle in a parking lot? Who is liable for the cost of 
I'm assuming personal insurance based on this presentation. So Sarah, if a person damages your vehicle in a parking lot and they stay and it's their fault, they would end up paying you know, for that if they, get the, if they have insurance. If it's a hit and run, it's your personal insurance. Hopefully you have decent people that would stay. All right, Ken says, if I am in travel status, can I take a GOV to go fishing after work? No, folks, no. That's personal use. Now, if you're in Alaska, <laughs> Alaska has been a great place for a lot of this stuff. Russian River, we would re routinely have GSA vehicles that are parked there. Some of them were legit, others weren't. Fish and Wildlife Service has GSA vehicles, and they're down there managing the fishery. And they're down there, quote unquote, fishing. And they're fishing, and they're watching for, you know, funny how you fish with just a lure and no hook, because they're out looking for violators. But as a recreation, Ken, no, no, I wouldn't do it. Melinda says, if you incorporate leave with TDY with a rental vehicle, can you use a rental vehicle for personal use if you pay out of pocket for the days you were on leave? Melinda, there is no way to separate the, the rental if you're renting under the, uh, uh, under the rental agreement number four. That is the quote unquote old way where there was the case law and there was the uh, red book appropriations law red book that said, you know, there's no reason you can't use it for personal use. The problem was reimbursing the government. Well, now the travel folks have addressed it. And simply put, you cannot use a official, a federal rental vehicle that you rent under rental agreement number four for personal use. Adam says, apologies if this was asked, but from your experience, do you see a benefit to having your GOV included on your personal automobile insurance policy? Um, Adam, yeah, there could be a benefit there if you happen to have the um, other owned vehicle rider. Uh, and it sounds like you might have a vehicle assigned to you. Most of the case, most of the times, and, and this is even when I was the vehicle control officer for the Air Force, <clears throat> when we had an accident, it, it was an accident. It wasn't an on purpose. And on purpose is totally something different. That's criminal. And we have never, in, in my experience, never charged the Air Force person or, or the driver for damaging a government vehicle. Never. So, but does it happen? Yes, it does. So in that case is where it might be, you know, it, it might be beneficial, but that's something that you would have to decide. But I have not seen to where it has been an issue. Good question. Thank you. Lee says, while renting a vehicle to travel to a training site, is personal use to rent a vehicle going to a casino or movie, draft house, or, or eat allowed? Um, if you're renting a vehicle, casino, uh, gray area, you can go to eat there the way it's written. But just like that person before, can I go to the mall to eat and then watch a movie? No. If you're going to go there to eat, that's fine. But just remember, perception is reality. Perception is reality. If someone sees a GOV at a casino, it's not going to go good. Even if what you're doing is legit, you know, perception is reality. Now, if you've got limitations, sure, use that. But don't get the temptation to go throw a couple quarters in the slot machine and, you know, because that's when the bad things happen. Laura says, in the past, an agent had a 30-day TDY. They take their families. I always advise that families are not allowed in the rental, correct? Um, if it's a government rental, it depends on the agency, Laura. There's no hard, fast rule that I'm aware of. But the thing of that is, though, when they're running under rental agreement four, take a look at what it says in there. Because if something happens, are they going to be covered under Federal Tort Claims Act? I can't answer that question because I don't know for sure. And it might be agency specific. Gene says, another question, staff has to use POV instead of GOV due to past winter driving conditions suddenly. She emailed and got permission from supervisor. Is this considered a good enough authorization? Sounds good to me, Gene. She got an email. She's got it in writing. But that person needs to also submit mileage. Get paid for it if you're going to use your vehicle. Joshua says, please explain again liability issues around the use of a POV for local, not TDY business meetings with partners, especially if they're in the opposite direction of the office for the morning commute or when the meeting location is on the way home and ends at 5 p.m. What kind of permission from my manager should I need in writing? Basically, you should get permission in writing to use your POV for government business, period. 
if you're going to use your POV for any type of government business, get the okay in writing. Whether you have to research your agency's uh, vehicle policies, whether you get it in the email, whether you get uh, a document, get it in writing. And then the follow of that, Josh, contact your insurance agency and see if you're covered for using your personal vehicle on federal government business. Remember, the biggest thing in all this, folks, is protect yourself. All right. If you have completed official business and you have a nearby doctor appointment, must you go all the way back to place of duty to get your POV, or can you just stop at your appointment and provide management documentation that you were, in fact, there? Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming that you're in a GOV. I would not do that. It's not official. I would go back and get my POV because... If something happens, meaning an accident, they're going to go back and they're going to look and they're going to say, okay, why were you there? The GOV is not for personal use and you used it for personal use. And if you would have came home before, instead of going to the appointment, you would have been in the accident. You may or may not be in the scope of your employment. Any personal use with a GOV, I would not recommend doing. Michael says, going back to rendering emergency aid. Thank you for answering my general question. However, I guess I'm wondering if I need authorization from my immediate supervisor, low level, center director, mid level, or agency, high level. I'm going to help someone in trouble either way, no matter what vehicle I'm in, deal with it later. But I'm generally curious about the rules. Michael, it depends on your agency. If you work for GSA fleet, you're covered. It doesn't matter. It's already in our document. If you work for social security, and well, no, that's POV's use, um, I, uh, that's the only one that I know of right now that says, you know, hey, you can render aid in emergency. Uh, and Otherwise, it depending on your agency, this is agency centric. It could be your low level, mid level, or high level supervisor that can okay that, but it depends strictly on your agency. Natalie says, please clarify, I obtained a rental car using the government rate through Concur. Do I need to purchase the additional insurance when I check out at the rental car at the airport? No. <clears throat> nope, you don't. If you do, you're just spending more money. Take a look, Natalie, at rental agreement number four. Take and look at what it provides. It provides for normal use any damage that happens. If you, yeah, I mean, you, you could get it to protect yourself or something, you know, that if you happen to go on a frolic or do something that, you know, wouldn't be covered, but it would be an abuse item. But even then, if it's an abuse item, I don't think the additional insurance, you know, um, uh, covers you. Take a look at rental agreement number four. A lot of really good information there. If I'm on TUI in a rental vehicle, can I allocate my expense with my agency between personal and business uses? No, not anymore. Used to, not anymore. Rental vehicle is for official use only. That is the new change that was a year ago. Jonathan says, if you were on a TUI and go to the grocery store to pick up food, is it okay to buy and transport alcohol if a GOV, in a GOV, back to the hotel and consume off-duty? Uh, Jonathan, I can't give you a yes or no on that. That would be on your agency. Just like before, there's folks that have wine and whatnot, and they have done that. I've seen it done. I may or may not have done that myself. <clears throat> I think the statute of limitations expires in a couple of years if that's the case. But um, it, it, it's, it's up to your agency. And remember, once again, even if it's allowed, look at the perception. Perception's reality. So you know, do no more than your career can handle. Ask the question first. Tyler says, if I'm using a GOV for a day trip to complete an inspection and the visit takes longer than planned, which results in me to return to my duty station after scheduled any work hours, is that a problem? As I would be driving after my official work day ends. Tyler, no, that would not be an issue. Why are you in that vehicle afterwards? Well, because the job went longer than I anticipated. So I got done. I wasn't out frolicking. I wasn't out messing around. I wasn't out doing anything I shouldn't be. I was driving home after I got done, and it just was after hours. Anthony says, does the fire extinguisher in a GSA vehicle need an inspection tag? How often does it need to be checked and who checks it? Um, huh. NFPA 10 requires an annual inspection. Uh, supposed to have a tag. And if you are on a military installation, your fire department can do that. There's also other places out there uh, that do fire extinguisher inspections. And it's a good idea to have because if the vehicle catches on fire, ideally you want that extinguisher there to put it out. And it sounds like it's a medium heavy truck there, Anthony, and it's a uh, 
uh, it's a requirement, DOT requirement. Laura says, when in, TD, when in TDY and you are assigned rental driver, can you allow others in TDY to use a vehicle when you can't take them? Laura, that is a fantastic question. Take a look at rental agreement number four. Rental agreement number four lays it out exactly. So, yes, when you rent a vehicle under rental agreement number four and you sign for the vehicle, you're not the assigned driver. You're just one to sign for it. And anyone who works in your agency and has a driver's license can drive that vehicle. They don't have to be on the rental agreement. That's why I say read rental agreement number four. It is a fantastic tool. There is so much good information there that a lot of people aren't aware of and how it applies. Scott says, how about in a rental car? What do you show for proof of insurance? Uh, it's going to be on your rental agreement, Scott. It'll be on that rental agreement. Gabrielle says, hi, I'm in West Texas as a motor vehicle operator for the vet ride system as my job requires a commercial driver's license and I'm also under DOT hours of service for passengers. As our uh, catchment area is over 5,000 square miles, who would be liable if I'm pulled over and ran, ran out of my hours of service but still have to get back to my station? Uh, great question, Gabrielle. Great question. And I, you know, based on what you're saying, and this is the non-legal Devin answer because I really don't know, I would say that that is your responsibility to track. And if you are going over your hours, something needs to be changed. But I think that is your responsibility. Now, with that being said, you work for the VA. Is there a exception to the rule in that case? Is there an exception in VA documentation that says you can do that? Karen says, Devin, can you restate the name of the document needed in the vehicle stating GOV insurance? Yep. Hang on a sec. I'm going to pull a copy out of my desk here. It is GSA form 6, uh, 1627. GSA form 1627. It's the fleet vehicle accident kit. On the back side, it has proof of insurance for operators of GSA owned vehicles, and it's got everything there. And it says this constitute your proof of insurance and will be kept with your vehicle at all times. And if you need them, contact your fleet service manager. They will be able to get them for you. Marty says, I believe I registered with a course, but I did not receive a confirmation. Can someone confirm this for me? Marty, I promise you, you've received a registration and you're registered because the only way to get in is if you're registered. And since you gave us a question, you're good to go. Sarah says, you mentioned if on TDY, you can't use a GOV or rental vehicle to go fishing because that's personal use. But I thought earlier in this presentation, you mentioned that on TDY, you can use your vehicle to go to a place of worship or a hike. Can you elaborate on what is personal use and what is enrichment or comfort? So remember how I said, as far as uh, uh, vehicles for, uh, you can use a, a GOV for going to places of worship. That's already authorized. It's already in writing. And then other things for the sustenance, comfort, and health of the employee. That hike could be your uh, workout. That hike could be something like that. But that's agency specific. And it's very hard to actually say what is, what isn't. But if you're going to use that vehicle for personal use, going to see, visit a friend, going to, you know, a, a going to shopping at the mall instead of just getting something to eat, that's the personal use that I'm referring to. Lisa says, can I use my POV for government training, but not say I am using it for government business? <laughs> Lisa, that's a good one. I would not recommend, you know, splitting hairs like that. Because remember I talked about the investigation? They get really personal. So please tell me the difference between government training and not government business. Are you taking training for the government? Yes, but it's not government business. No. Okay. I think universes would collide if that could ever be actually figured out in some real way. Protect yourself, Lisa. You, 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 if something happens, then you're on the hook for it if you weren't allowed. And that's where things get bad uh, for you, you know, as far as you, know, you might end up being personally responsible for it where your insurance wouldn't step in and cover it. Thank you for the question. That was, that was good. That, that gave me a chuckle. I appreciate you. Thank you. Sony says, thank you for the presentation. Is there any guidance on employee liability as it relates to maintaining the GOV, maintenance, upkeep, damages, not related to accidents? Is there any guidance on employee financially being liable? 
Um, so <clears throat> we have the GSA fleet leasing guide. Take a read on that. We pay for everything. GSA pays for everything. That is not abuse. And if it's an abuse item, we bill the BOAC. And if you follow, you know, the maintenance schedules, get the oil change when they tell you get it changed. If you if you notice an issue, say brakes grinding or something just not right, take in and get it fixed. Now, as far as liability goes, um, I I I cannot say I've ever, I actually I've never held a person liable, but we have had an agency that did not get oil changes on a vehicle after 22 and 24,000 miles respectively, despite being told, despite the oil light being on. Both motors blew, and the agency paid for it. It's up to the agency to go after that person if there is is you know if they think that there is a negligence issue, but it isn't anything GSA would uh, would get involved in ourselves. That's where that flipple or report of survey that investal, official investigation would come into play. Monique says, uh, "What is used for the proof of re proof of registration? You can download a document that shows." who is using the vehicle. There is no proof of registration. We don't register our vehicles, but there is a form that shows who the vehicle is leased out to. And that's the form you can have as far as GSA goes. Uh, and that can be, you can get that on fleet.gov. Michael says, if someone uses their POV on official government travel, but a GOV is available for use and our POV mileage reimbursements are allowed to be claimed. Also, can I as a supervisor claim to use the GOV in this case? Uh, Michael, yeah, you can. You can say no. GOV is available. You can use it. Um, if a GOV is available and they use their POV, they will be reimbursed at the reduced rate. Now, as far as having them, ha requiring them, yeah, you can. I would do that with the help of HR. HR and finance folks, as far as those two questions go. Chris says, fishing is like cutting out the middleman. <laughs> Chris, good one. Here's another good one. Fishing is like cutting out the middleman, like the grocery store and going directly to Nature's Sushi, sushi Bar. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John Schaefer says, the link for rental agreement number four has changed. Um, John, thanks. I'll make sure that I got the current one. And I'm just going to go ahead and type that so everyone can see this it'll be in the in the uh, questions and answers there you go thanks john um uh, are we allowed to drive on the toll meaning the toll roads sure you can drive on the toll roads you can drive on toll roads like for me i do drive my my gov on toll roads uh we have a transponder to pay for the tolls um so yeah good question vicky thank you very much all right all right folks we still have 900 folks in the queue who are here listening to me talk. There's no more questions up there. I'll just be here a couple more minutes. And then uh, otherwise, we're going to go ahead and close this one out. And what I will say, we've got three more sessions. If you found this beneficial, send it to anyone else. This is for any person who drives a government vehicle, not just GSA lease vehicle. It applies to everyone. Get the word out because it's important. I don't want anyone to get in trouble. More importantly, I don't want you to have to pay any money out of your, your own pocket for something that happens. So I'll stick around a bit. Thank you for your time, everyone. Have a good one. John, you're very welcome. Kelly, thank you for the compliment. That's very good. Appreciate it. Chris says, I made this requirement for my team. Great presentation information. Chris, thank you very much. And I'm glad that that uh, I'm glad that, that they're going to get the training as well, too. All right, question. If I am on home visits in a rural area and I'm near my home, I quickly stop by my home to use the bathroom. Wow. You know what? Hmm. Here's what I would do if I were you. And I, I believe your first name is pronounced Raniti. Uh, in this case, I would contact my supervisor and just say, hey, here's where I'm at. There's no public bathrooms. Can I stop by my house? I don't think any person would say no, because what's the other option? You know, you can't stop, park your car and go use the woods. That's not kosher. Imagine that picture being sent to house my driving at GSA.gov. 
Um, ask your supervisor and get that permission. And I don't see why they would not give you the okay. Kimberly says, as a tribal department, I transport youth, is that covered or do I need them listed individually? Uh, Kimberly, I would say that, that is, if that is part of your mission, that's your official use, you're good to go. You shouldn't have to name them individually. Jose, you're very welcome. Thank you for the compliment. Glad that, that you learned a lot of good information. Brenda says, I'm new to the program. Who can I contact to validate who is authorized from home to work in my immediate location? Brenda, send me an email. I'll, I'll get you pointed in the right direction. Please. James says, if you're involved in the distro to all future courses or current information, I'd like to be added since I am a fleet manager. Oh, Stacy, thank you. Stacy's taking care of that one. Angela says, what documentation needs to be kept in agency-owned vehicles? Do we need proof of registration or insurance? Uh, Angela, what I would say is, yeah, get the, the quote-unquote insurance. It's the same thing as far as Federal Tort Claims Act. And then whatever document your agency has is, as far as it being a government vehicle. And in fleet.gov, um, GSA fleet.gov, you can pull agency-owned vehicles. It's the old FMVRS, but you can pull the same type of document showing the form that shows uh, um, that it's a government vehicle. Kristen says, we live in a very rural area and getting the GSA trucks washed requires to use our own money quarters to go get it washed. We do have a car wash here in town, but it doesn't accept the wax cards. Is there any way that GSA could get with more of the chain cars to accept uh, the wax cards? Um, Kristen, there are no no car washes that expect that accept the wax card. Um, I am sorry that you guys have to pay your own money as far as that goes. And then I don't know what a good answer for that is. And it's got to do with the credit card processing software. Uh, for me here in Pennsylvania, we go to a gas station, we can get a car wash in conjunction with fueling up. That's how we get car washes. The car washes could call WEX and get a credit card, but a lot of people, it, they may not even have a credit card processing machine. Um, I don't have a good answer for you. And it, it's, it's you know, GSA, we provide $25 per vehicle per month for car washes. And that's just right now, that's just, a, it, it's not captured in our rates. That is just an extra that we're providing right now. And best thing I say is contact your agency fleet manager, talk to your fleet service rep, see if there's anything there that they could go, or anything that they could do. Sarah says, if you're on TDY with POV, I assume POV can later be used if for personal use. If you're on TDY with a GOV or rental, can you use Uber or Lyft for personal use? Yeah, absolutely. If you're on TDY and you have your own POV, that's your POV. You can do whatever you want to with your vehicle. Make sure you have the approval to use it on, to take it to the TDY location. What you do with that vehicle? Absolutely. And then as far as with being uh, uh, in a GOV on a TDY, I would recommend Uber and Lyft. You can use that for your personal use. You can use that for, uh, for that personal use part. Joshua says, how to handle this? I go to a meeting in a city for business, TDY, includes flight and car rental, but I want to stay longer a few days to visit some family or friends. How should I handle this? Turn the car on Friday, stay through Saturday, Sunday, fly home Sunday? Sure. Yeah. What you want to do if you're going to take some leave time in conjunction with, just ask yourself a question. Okay, am I official? Am I on official business when I'm driving this vehicle? afterwards. The other option is uh, if you come back on Sunday and you've got those two extra days of rental, don't use a vehicle for the personal use. Uber it, lift it, something like that. Um, yeah, kind of unique, Joshua. It, it's do no more than your, your career can handle, number one. Number two, ask. Better ask permission than forgiveness because in forgiveness, something bad has already happened. I've got one here. I won't mention the name. I'm in a situation where my supervisor does not want to authorize me to use POV since he doesn't want to pay mileage reimbursement, but I'm willing to use my POV at my own expense, uh, which is advantageous to the government. Yeah, it is, but it's not fair to you. But it sounds like I should not take my POV unless I'm specifically authorized. Yes, absolutely. Don't use your POV unless you're specifically authorized because, <clears throat> excuse me, because if something happens, you're going to be on the hook, and, and I don't want you to be on the hook, and it could get expensive. And um, the other part, too, is, is that when, when we do have people that 
user POV, didn't have authorization, and they go to claim their, their repair, suddenly they now have learned that their insurance company won't cover them for personal, their POV for federal government use. All right, folks, we're at the end of it. We have been here for two hours. Thank you, everyone, for your time. I do appreciate it. And we'll go from there. Yep. Thanks, Devin. And uh, Stacey, very welcome. for your answering questions. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's desktop workshop. As a reminder, the slides are posted on our desktop workshop website, and the recording will be posted there as well. You'll receive a follow-up email with a certificate later today or tomorrow. Have a good day, everyone.